So that's from the message issue queue. And <laughs> obviously, uh, when I read it, I felt ashamed. Uh, because I do make a fuss about the message model. And reg regarding that commerce stuff, uh, I still have a really sad memory of uh, Ryan from Commerce Guys literally on his knees begging and crying and saying, no, let's have one product for each variation. And I was like, no, nah, we will have one million products. <laughs> and, and I felt ashamed because, you know, this guy is using my model and it doesn't work for him. And now we need to lose more time in getting into the issue and write a new issue. So I've decided uh, to rectify that problem. And I've uh, invented and actually developed the RAG EAG commonly known as the ridiculously annoying issue generator, or in short, <laughs> RAGE. So the idea of RAGE is that it automates your uh, issue submission. So in the first version, I actually had one checkbox, uh, obscure but complexity. And when you submit it, it basically finds an issue that already has tons of comments and adds another comment. And it makes sure to add a lot of low quality information there. <laughs> and why are you laughing? It's serious. And, <laughs> and just in case you, the maintainer, don't have enough uh, low quality information, it will make sure to zip the whole internet and attach it to the issue. <laughs> but I told myself that I could do better. I could make it obscure, even more obscure. So I changed the checkbox to obscure. And when you submit it, it creates something like, can create work, a group. It doesn't work. <laughs> But I'm a perfectionist, you see. And I told myself, Amitai, you can do better than that. So I made the obscure checkbox obscure. And now, <laughs> and now when you submit it, it just says, can't. And it won't. Next, we have the checkbox saying every piece of information is equally important, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory what uh, the output is. <laughs> After that, we have the assume the maintainer knows everything. Nay, assume the maintainer knew, knows everything in every possible language, and when you submit it, the output is this error. <laughs> Who knows which error it is? It's in Tamil. That's the, the clue that I can give you. It's the maximum function nesting. And I'm using Google Translate to help me with that. And uh, thanks, thanks to, to, Google Translate, uh, to Google Translate, I've actually realized that it, there, it's also a cultural thing, because the same error has different severity level in different languages. So for example, if I'll ask uh, a Google Translate to read out loud the English version, it sounds like that. Fatal error, maximum function nesting level of 100 reached, aborting. So you can hear by her tone, she's not really mad at you or angry, <laughs> but she's kind of disappointed. And that's the Spanish version. Fatal error. Función de nivel de anidamiento máximo de 100 llegó. Abortar. <laughs> to better understand the next checkbox, I would like to read a little poem. Once upon a time, there was an issue, and now it is fixed, and now it is closed, and now it is dead. <laughs> So the next checkbox is called Resurrection. When you, click on <laughs> when you click on the checkbox, uh, you have uh, a slider with the issue queue etiquette awareness. And you are able to change the different levels. And basically, when you submit it, when we're starting with the minimum, uh, like the, 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 the lowest uh, level, it will find an issue that is already closed for years. And the next step, that it will just set it uh, to active. After that, it will set the, the, stat the priority from, uh, from normal to critical. And if, of course, it will not fail adding a comment such as setting to critical as I'm on a tight schedule. <laughs> and of course, me as a maintainer, you can, uh, uh, you can guess how I uh, react. I scream at the office, everybody stop. This guy is on a tight schedule. <laughs> Next is setting the status that needs review meaning that you as the maintainer, you need to review what this guy is saying. And then if you take the slider, the issue queue etiquette awareness slider, all the way to the maximum, it will do the most insulting thing. It will set the status to needs work, meaning that 
You do maintain, you thought you fixed it, but you need to work on it just a little more. <laughs> and after I finished working on, on, on Rage, on, on, on that version, I have actually realized that Rage can also cater the maintainers. And this time I don't need uh, checkboxes and fancy widgets. I think it's just enough to have one button saying generate response, so when you click on it, it just generates a response. <laughs> So, organic groups. <laughs> I, have, I had quite a few sessions and podcasts and blog posts about uh, the basic concepts of organic groups. So I'd like to take advantage of this presentation and talk about uh, some more advanced uh, concept. And we will talk, we'll start with the selection handler, which is actually applying not only to OG, it's part of the entity reference, so it applies to entity reference in Drupal 7, and it applies also to entity reference, which is now in the core of Drupal 8. So, what do we have here? We know OG, the basic stuff, we have group and we have group content and it's uh, group and permission on the, on the uh, group level and it's working nicely with field API and entity API and views and so on. But let's talk about that idea of selection handlers. So over here I have a post, this is a group content. So I see the title and I see a group audience field. Now I'm, as an administrator, I see two widgets. One is the your groups and one is the other groups. And remember, your, the your groups is changing from user to user. So Amitai's use, your groups is different from Jim's your group or, or John's your groups. And what I'm seeing over here, the your groups, uh, I call it a field mode in, in OG didn't have a better name, so this is the default field mode, every user will, will see it. And the other groups, this is only for privileged user, I call it the admin field mode. So, OG is taking advantage, advantage of the fact that entity, entity reference is plug pluggable and it allows us to have our own logic when we are creating, select, uh, when we are creating, um, sorry, have our own logic when we want to fetch values into the your groups. So, for example, mm -hmm. if I go to the group audience field settings and I've enabled the model called organic groups example, this is part of the OG package, I have a new selection handler that I can now change. So, looking a bit into the code, this is OG and I have OG example, plugins, entity reference, selection. And let's have a, a tiny look at the code. It's not really important what's written over here, just and to understand the concept, I have the OG example selection handler. I have the function build entity field query, which is basically the function that builds the logic of saying which groups should appear in the your groups and which one should appear in the other groups. And in the OG example, I'm doing a really silly example saying if the field mode is default, meaning, uh, 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 meaning a normal user, then show me all the groups that are below node ID5. Otherwise, if I'm an administrator in the other, other groups, show me all, all the node IDs that are above five. And in Drupal Commons, uh, we took uh, advantage of that, Acquire's Drupal Commons, and uh, we've written a selection handler for Drupal Commons that allows people to post content into groups they don't belong to. Up until now, that was not uh, let's say, easily possible in uh, Drupal 7, and now thanks to those selection handler, you can have it, for example, in Drupal Commons. But this is now also now part of OG itself. Out of the box, you're able to have create permission, meaning create, uh, create node permission for non-members, and this is using entity reference pre-populate. Up, up until now, we didn't have that, and every time uh, people were asking me why we don't have it. I was saying because we don't have enough context, and I'd like to explain. For example, if I have a group content, a certain node that is associated with the other groups, and a user comes and wants to edit that node, then the OG system knows which group to ask, is that user allowed to edit that group? But when I'm creating a new node, it's still not associated with any group, so I cannot know it. However, if I go to node add post right now in the OG's uh, new version, if I go to node add post under your groups, I see nothing. However, in the URL, if I pass it the field name and the group ID, then OG is smart enough to know that that group should be populated and it checks if I have the permission and then he use, it uses it. Multiple, sorry, 
multiple group audience fields. This one is one of the reasons why I rewrote uh, OG the second time. And because at first it was uh, really hard coded to a field called OG group ref, but it's no longer hard coded. And again, using an example for Drupal comments, I will, I will try to explain this concept. So um, in Drupal comments, they want to have what they call trusted contacts. It's basically a mini Facebook. So not only a user can post contact into different groups, which are nodes, they also want to have uh, uh, this feature that will allow a user to have friends, okay, like in Facebook, and they'll be able to, um, to post content in, uh, to themselves. So basically what we were saying, since we already have the OG infrastructure in place, we're saying, okay, each user is actually also a group. So I'd like to go over uh, the different, uh, the different sc uh, screens so we'll better understand the flow of how we built it. So we have here the users, uh, the account setting fields. We can see that OG out of the box has just one field called group membership. Through that field, that's an entity reference field, a group audience field, which is referencing nodes, different nodes that the, the user belongs to. So in order to have that functionality, the trusted content functionality, we go to the OG field settings, we, make a, we uh, make a user also a group, a bit confusing, but that's the way it is. And we also had another group audience field. Remember, multiple group audience field? Now that's, that's the second field. And the second field, I call it this time trusted contacts. So now again, in the account settings fields, we can see that the user now has, uh, is a group, okay, just by adding that field, that, that group field and a second field called the trusted contacts. After that, I create a new OG membership type. Okay, OG membership, that's the entity and it can have different bundles, like node can have different node types, so different bundles, article, page, and so on. So that's OG membership. So usually when you use OG, then the membership is the default, it's the default bundle, but you can have as many bundles as you want and you can attach different fields to it and so on. So, Back, I'm looking at the trusted content fields and I click on the edit link and then in the field settings, I'm able to say that the target type is a user, meaning I'm gonna reference groups which are users. And when I'm gonna reference it, when I'm gonna create a new membership, I'm gonna create it through the trusted contacts membership. And now when I'm going to a spe specific user, user one edit, for example, I can see I have two group audiences and each group audience is referencing its own groups. And here lays all the power because you can have as many group audiences as you want with different settings. One can, have, can be required in multiple value and the other non-required with, with one value. And for the coders among us, if you wanna attach, if you wanna associate two content together, then you'll use the function OG group, which is the API function, but have a look that I'm creating that association sp through a specific field called the trusted contacts. That was the most hard co uh, concept to explain. From here, it, becomes, it, be it becomes easier. So when we have that, now it makes more sense that we have the roles and permission per group type. We didn't have that before. So I can have completely different roles. I'm talking about OG roles, not site-wide roles. I can have completely different roles for the node and group and for the user itself. Different roles and different, per different permissions. The people page was also overruled, and now what we are seeing here, that's completely views, okay? Nothing is hard-coded here. Even the group overview on top, this is just uh, uh, an area handler. You can, you know, remove it or change it or move it to the footer or whatever you want. And down below this table is, again, using views and views bulk operation to have different actions so you can set different roles, you can set different status, active, uh, active pending blocked, and so on. And you can now also edit the membership directly uh, from that table if you have the right permission and change the different fields. So you can change maybe the request message, but maybe you have expiration date uh, attached to it, donations or whatever, you can do that. Query magic. So we know that the post is referencing a group using entity reference. But 
we're actually not using the field storage, meaning that if you go into in the database, in the table of the field, there's nothing over there. We actually use the OG membership entity to do that referencing. And the reason we are using it is because we need some metadata. It's not enough to say this post is associated with the group. We also know, want to know when was it created, what is the state, active or pending, and we can add different fields to it. So even though we don't have that information in the field storage, we can still have such a query saying, bring me all the nodes which are referencing through a group audience field a specific group. And through some black magic and voodoo, it will actually work. <coughs> Accessibility. So this one is again back to the, back to the issue queue. I, I, I saw this issue uh, not long ago asking to evaluate OG for accessibility. And uh, we've actually seen this page before. That's the first page I thought about, that uh, this page should definitely have, uh, should be checked for uh, accessibility. I had some doubts. And um, I, I, was really, I, really, I was really curious, so I downloaded uh, a screen reader. And uh, it, it's pretty, pretty amazing how smart uh, screen readers are and how they can analyze the, the, the page. And I actually recorded it, and I, I, want, I want you to hear. Bundles, post, group, fields, group audience, group, 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 group. <laughs> Holy crap, how many more groups? Oh my god, this page sucks. I am just a screen reader. I can't bear it any longer. Please make it stop. Patches are welcome. <laughs> so first we had the message model, and now we have the message stack. The message stack is composed of three different models, message, message notify, and message subscribe. Message is uh, probably the important model, is, and it's what's doing the heavy lifting. So the idea of message is that it allows us to create different activity, stream, activity streams, and it has zero assumptions regarding how I want to create those activity streams. So to better understand the, the, the concept of what the, the me uh, message is, we have different message types. It's equivalent to saying, like we have a no type, right? Article, page, and so on. We can have different message types, and those messages are basically templates of events that happen. So I can have, for example, you can see, no, you can't, because it's, <laughs> it's too tiny. <laughs> Imagine that you can see that <laughs> it's basically some HTML saying a link to a user that created a link to some title using some Drupal tokens. And it has also a special token, which is hard to see, which is just uh, at site and with curly brackets instead of the, the normal brackets. And we'll talk about those tokens later. And when I go into the message type itself and I edit it, so I see some information, what's the name of the message and so on, but I also see the message text. That's a field, that's a normal field with multiple values, and it has different deltas. And each delta I call a partial for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> That's the way how I call it. And in each delta, you, ha you are able to have your own, uh, own text. So in, on delta zero or partial number zero, I have the text saying what we saw before, the user that created something, something. And in the, in the second partial, we can see, wow. In the second partial, we can see that, uh, there is a token, and a token that brings the nodes teaser. We can also attach different fields to those message types, for example, the node reference field, so we can have our own logic going on there. And like I said, message has zero assumption regarding, uh, uh, regarding how you're going to use it. It's not as smart as a screen reader, so it cannot read its own, uh, its own text. So it's up to you, the implementer, to, to create new messages. So if you'll enable the message example model, it's part of the message uh, part of the message package. You can see that we have here hook node insert. There's actually more comments than the code itself. We have here hook node insert, meaning when there, whenever there is a new node that is being created, create a new message, reference, reference it to the node that was just created, and save the message. 
And this means that now we have a new message, message with ID number one. Like there is no, with no ID number one, there is message ID number one saying, Stu Stepper created Proboquibos Voco. I always make sure to read it out loud, uh, whatever the well generated created. And if I create many messages like that, then I will see that the view that comes with message example show me all the messages that were created. And it doesn't look very exciting, I know that. Uh, yeah, it looks a little lame, but I can throw some buzzwords at you, and since you are all geeks, I think you'll get excited, like translatable fields, and TPL overrides, and pre-process function, and view modes. <laughs> and personally, these words fill me up with so much joy, I've decided to make a nice postcard out of it. <laughs> But also with some hard work and using, for example, the message model along with Babel model. This is a, mess uh, this is a, a model written by uh, Fubi, which allows you basically to have uh, comments attached to different entities. So with some glue code and a little styling, we're able to have uh, an uh, activity stream that looks a bit like Facebook. So we talked about the translatable field, and that's one of the biggest features of message. That field, that message text field, which is a normal field, is actually translatable. That's part of what Drupal cores uh, gives us. So it means that one, that field can hold information for the English version and for the Spanish version and for the Tamil version. So the text, this text, which is completely unreadable, is in English. And that text, which is also completely unreadable, it's in Spanish. So the tokens are in different places, but those are the same tokens, just the words that are gluing it together are now in Spanish. So if I go to en slash message ex example or es slash message example, I'm seeing the same message just being rendered in different, in different languages. Same message ID, different language. So beforehand, uh, we saw that orange looking, uh, weird looking uh, token. So. What happens? Let's talk about the yellow, token, the yellow tokens, the normal one. I have here the message field node reference title. Every time I show this message, every time you hit F5, every time you're refreshing your page, message loads and it goes to the token system and it tells the token system, please bring me the title of that node. And the, and the token system node loads the node, gets the, gets the title and brings it back to the message. And that's fine because, you know, it's Drupal, somebody might edit the node and change the title and I wouldn't want my activity stream to reference uh, stale data. I wouldn't want it to reference and I wouldn't want it to show a title which is wrong. But if we're looking at that orange token, which is the message username, meaning bring me the username, there's absolutely no reason for message every time it's being loaded, every time it's being shown to ask the token system, bring me that username, bring me that username. That username is not going to change, so there's really no value in loading the user every time and uh, asking the username. So if we are using that special token, then message understand that whenever the message is being saved, it calculates the information, getting the username, for example, Amitai, and hard codes it. So the next time I'm going to show the message, instead of calling the token system, I'm just gonna replace it with the already hard-coded version. And I won't lie to you, message, when you're showing it, it has uh, some uh, performance penalty. And um, you should take care about it. And whenever I'm thinking about performance, I think uh, about uh, Mark Sonnebaum from Aquaya. He's a, real performance, uh, he's a real performance wizard. And I learned a lot from him. And he's also a wizard uh, with words. He's really eloquent. And, and I really like the, the tender way uh, he explains how to improve performance. <laughs> so it's true. You should cache your views. Even if it's just for 10 seconds or 30 seconds or one minute, don't hit your database so hard. Next in the stack the message notify. 
So now we have a message and we understand it. And the next log logical thing is, after we had the activity stream, is sending it. And pay attention, we don't call it uh, message email, we call it message notify, because it, ha it's, it has a pluggable ar architecture. Basically, message notify allows us to have notifier plugins. And those notifier plugins are responsible for two things. Declaring view mode, which we'll see uh, in a few, in a few uh, minutes, and sending it. Out of the box, message notify comes with two plugins. One is the email notifier plugin, and the other is the SMS notifier plugin. So the email, for example, is responsible of having a subject and a body and the logics, for example, that we need to strip the tag from the subject. Whereas in SMS, we don't have a subject, we, don't, we just have a body, and we need to make sure that we have a phone number. So again, looking a bit at, at code, these are the view modes for the email saying, I need to have a view mode for the subject and a view mode for the body. And then again, looking a bit at code, the code is absolutely not relevant right now, just to understand that this is the amount of code needed to create the plugin. And for example, we can see that over here, we are stripping the tags from the subject. So now the view modes should make a little more sense. Remember those partial, that delta. So over here, I'm now in the manage display of my message type. So under the email subject view mode, I take the zero partial. Just the partial, just that part will be on the view mode. And in the email body, I'll take another partial. And message is actually nice enough that whenever you're editing it, it shows you each view mode that partial appears. And now I think you can see the true power of message because you can have a lot of different view modes, meaning you can have, for example, if you have an activity stream, you can have a teaser activity stream, and you can have a long activity stream, and you can send an email with certain partials, and you can send uh, SMS with other partials, and each one will render itself, as you decide it will render itself, plus the correct language. Message subscribe. And not only reach, we reached the last uh, stack in message subscribe, we've also uh, reached slide number 102. And I always tell myself that that's the best slide to actually introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Amitai Burstin. Amitai Bu is the nickname, and I'm, from, uh, I'm a co-founder of Gizra. Gizra is a boutique development shop in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. And we're doing some interesting stuff, and we have some fancy clients. Uh, one of them is Harvard University. Harvard University. <laughs> that our team is working uh, with their team. And in case you have a university and you're looking to develop a site, you should definitely look at the Open Scholar distribution. Even if you're not going to use it, you should definitely look at the code. There are some great stuff over there. Uh, another client that we are working with is, is uh, Acquia. I guess you probably heard about them. Uh, we're helping uh, them work. Uh, we're helping them uh, in development of the Drupal Commons, and that's like a really, really rapid sales pitch that I gave you. And actually, like 90%, 99 of the reasons why I'm here in DrupalCon is because I want to find the next big client. But there's one more percent of why I'm here, and that's because basically I'm really proud of what I'm doing. And I like it, and I like people using it. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, Twitter is nice, and evaluation is nice, and everything. But uh, I really encourage you to take advantage of the fact that you guys are here, and I'm here. And if you use my models, and you enjoy it, or my presentation, and so on, come say hello, introduce yourself. And I can assure you that that 1% is what keeps me motivated for the rest of the year. So back in the days in Drupal 6, although there is also a Drupal 7 version, we had messaging and notification. I wouldn't say what I think about it. <laughs> I just put two arrows regarding showing when it, when it was last updated. So basically, message subscribe is just a really thin layer, just a, more of a glue model which glues together uh, message and message notify. And the idea is that the subscription system is actually being dealt by flag model. 
So we can have different flags, for example, the subscribe underscore user, subscribe underscore node, basically every flag that is prefixed by the word subscribe, message subscribe, treats it as its own. But it's important to know that the word node and user is not important. We can have also subscribe underscore OG and, and, and it will use it. The flag is actually responsible on showing the flag links. So you are able as the implementer, again, it doesn't have many assumptions. It's up to you, the implementer, to decide where your links should appear. And if you want to define the access, then flag is a great model and it has its own hooks and its own uh, access system that you can uh, set according to your business logic. And if you enable the, the message subscribe UI, which is an optional model, it will show you a tab in the user page which just shows you all the different content you are subscribed to. Again, this is views. This is really highly customizable. If, if, you, if you don't want to use it, you can, just, you can just turn it off. But let's talk about the flow of message subscribe because unlike message, it has a little, some assumptions. So a comment was added. Somebody posted a comment. And then it's up to you to create a message from it. Okay, Who comment insert or something like, like that. And then it's up to you to pass it on to the message subscribe send message. That's the main, the main function. And then from there, it's up to me to get the basic context. And I, when I say context, I just wanted like every other model to abuse the word context. So it's not <laughs> context model context. It's not situl context. It's not panels context. It's my own context. And when I say context, and when I say context, I mean, for example, the node that the comment belongs to, the comment author and the node author. And then from the node, I extract also the terms that are associated with it and the groups that are associated with it. And from that, I get the subscribers, okay? I get all the people who actually flagged one of those entities. And then after I have all the user list, I can pass it on to message notify. And I don't pass it on just as a, as a flat list. I pass it on with the users with, every, with the Notify plugin. So one user can get, the, can get the message through email, another through SMS, another through fax, and so on. Sorry. So it's really highly customizable. Uh, if you want to alter the context or the subscriber list, you can do that. And there is also integration with uh, Drupal Q API because we want to make it scalable. I cannot send 1,000 emails at once. So if you check the use queue option, then it will just create an item in the, in the queue. And then it's up to you to create a drush from it. Uh, it's up to you to execute the drush that will actually uh, do the sending. And you can see that up until now, and if you've been following different presentations that I've done, I, I've never said that it's working uh, in a performant way. I never said that it's working fast. And it is working fast. <laughs> I'll say it just this time. And it, it is working uh, performant. But the reason I'm not saying it is mostly from uh, like uh, personal issues. <laughs> and the, the, the issue is that uh, me and my father, for years we have this weird, funny argument that I say that faster is better, exclamation mark, and my father is saying no, and it, these are funny arguments, like we're laughing and everything. And, and my dad has retired uh, this year after working in the same place for sev 37 uh, years in the same job. And a, a few months back we had the same argument, and I said faster is better, and he didn't laugh. I mean, he looked uh, a little sad, as if, uh, as if things are really just too fast for him. So, I, I mean, I love my dad, and I didn't want to make him feel bad. So I thought about where fast isn't necessarily better in the computer world, and I realized that password hashing is like a, a good example. So, for example, if I have the MD5 algorithm, if I'm a hacker and I want to hack into a site, and I, the, the site is using the MD5 algorithm, then it, it returns their response too fast. So as a hacker, it might take you to find one password, let's say, three days. And if you have other algorithms, uh, smarter algorithms, like, like the bcrypt, what happens, the bcrypt gets the password, and then it rehashes it like a hundred times, and then it returns the response. But it does it really, really slow. So the same hacker, if it would take three days in MD5, it will take like 12 years uh, with bcrypt. And 
I explained it to my father, and he's really intelligent, but uh, he didn't really understand it. And, and I, I wanted to give him another example, and I found it very be uh, beneficial to explain to educated people like my father, like, like, like you folks, uh, to give it example from the world of math. And sorry, I have a typo here. I meant math, like crystal math. <laughs> So we have our math addict, and, <laughs> and, and that's our hacker. And every night he goes to clubs. He has this, this trick he has. Every night he goes to this club. He says he's a somebody, he's somebody else. He impersonates to be somebody else. He goes inside the clubs. He steals all the money, and he buys math. And every night he goes to the club. That's the bouncer that he sees. That's MD5. He's really strong, he's really fast, not the most intelligent person in the world. <laughs> so the math addict says, I'm Benny. And, uh, and the bouncer is looking at the lid and says, I don't have no Benny. So he goes, so, I'm Johnny. I don't have no Johnny. And then, the <laughs> and then the hacker takes a big breath and he goes, Ricky, Gwen, Jane, Eric, Derek, Elvis, Brad, Britt, Alex, Tony, Robert, Chris, Ryan. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, yeah, Mr. Ryan. Sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go right in. Go right in. By the way, the cashier is all the way in the back. <laughs> and every club, for some reason, is hiring this bouncer. And I'm telling you, this hacker, this math addict, is being partying, is stealing so much money, and is buying the best math out there. I'm not talking about normal math, I'm talking about Heisenberg quality <laughs> blue math. And then one day our hacker is walking in the street and he sees a huge club. He's never seen something like that and he approaches, really cocky, he approaches to the entrance of the club and over there he sees Mr. Big Crypt. <laughs> An old Jewish guy from Brooklyn, not very fast, not very strong, Super intelligent. He takes a big breath. Ryan Bright, wait, 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 wait. You saying your name is Bra you say your name is Ryan? I have to check it. I'll go back. I have all my list over there. I will check it. But first I'm still on the phone with mother. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, mother. Yes, I had the Google, it was good. No. No, the gefilte fish I will wait for later. Yeah. Uh, mother, I have a very important customer here. It's a dirty filter high, eh? but you know, all anonymous users are treated alike, so I need to check it. <laughs> yeah, goodbye, mother. Okay, I go back to the... <laughs> I now go to the back. I have a little vault here, but I will go to the back anyway. So he goes all the way to the back. Now he's maybe slow, but he's very organized. So he goes over the list. Ah, yes, I see a Ryan. And oh my God, the hacker is like twitching. And I don't know what are the symptoms of when you're taking math and you're getting excited, but it's like all excited. And, but now we need to check it 99 more times. <laughs> So obviously the hacker is kicking and screaming and spitting and getting crazy and then he turns around and he goes away and he swears that he will never come back to this club. And Mr. Bicrypt is getting back to his, to his front desk and he mumbles to himself, I'm obligated to give them a response, but this time I will use a new technology I've learned. I will send them a text message. I will send him a text message with the message notifier SMS plugin. And he types on the computer really slowly. And then he screams to the hacker, which is all the way down the street. Hey, Ryan, look at your phone. Thank you. A Q&A means uh, questions and answers, by the way, so. <laughs> Amate, first of all, thank you very much for everything you do. Uh, Atrium 2 would not exist without all of your modules. Woo! So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
<laughs> I do have a question on the, uh, the, the email notifications and the, the message notify module. So right now with the, the email and SMS, we're sending out a, an individual message every time there's an event generated. Um, is it on your roadmap to do some kind of digesting where you have like a weekly summary kind of thing? Is that something you would be looking at putting into the, the message stack or is that something you'd be I looking at a contrib module to help with? I think it should start with the contrib. The problem with, the, with digest is I don't know how to do it in a generic way. I'm not sure there is a generic way. Yeah. So I think it could be explored in contrib and then if we have something solid, we can move it back into the message stack. Okay, we'll try to help you out with that. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? All right, everybody. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, so, uh, you talk about the notifications. I talk uh, about a lot of things, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a way or uh, w what is the best way for the other way around? So, you send me a notification by email, I reply and send you a mail and it becomes a comment or something you like that. You should talk with Mike just behind you because they just did it in Open Atrium, right? Am I? Yeah, they just did it. The fact that you are able to, to answer via email and get a response. Okay, cool. Okay. So, another question. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, in OG uh, different membership types. Yeah. Can you please make uh, uh, some other example yeah. when you use different... Uh, For example, if I have an... Uh, expiration membership, that I want a membership to be expired after one month, meaning, for me expired, meaning that the status will be from active to pending. Then I have an, I will have an expire membership type and I have a date field on it, and then I will need some custom logic, like in hook cron or something, check all the, all the membership types that are now beyond that date, and if so, just load those membership type, set the status from active into pending and save it. Uh, in that case, why would you use uh, different membership types instead of uh, a field inside the same membership? Because like, you, like a page is not an article. It's something different. It, it mm. represents something, uh, something different. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Hey there. Just speaking as a distribution developer, um, I wanted to say thank you because this, this whole architecture and this whole stack of OG2 and the message modules have really made it not just possible, but uh, practical for us as distribution developers to do things that our clients want and that we want as, as product designers. And so, you know, thank you for your innovation in this space. It's really been useful for all of us, you know, Commons and I know for Atrium and Commerce and, and really and uh, all of the distribution. So thanks. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>